So today is an important day in our church. We'll be having the annual meeting and we'll be voting on me to serve as official pastor in the congregational realm. They sometimes say settled pastor. And so I was thinking, man, I, I better preach a good sermon today, huh? This is a, this could be a big thing. And then I thought, you know, it's a really good thing that I've been here. It's actually over a year ago that I first talked uh, with the interview team. I actually first talked with Pastor Adam over a year ago. Uh, and it's been a good process. You've gotten to know me. But what's interesting is, yes, we're taking a vote on me, if you will, in, in a sense. But I've been voting on you. I've been voting on this church every single day of this entire year. And what we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 4 today is it's not just about the pastor. It's not just about does this vote go this way or that way. What Ephesians 4 says, the real vote is everyone. The real vote is the family of God. And in Ephesians 4, we're called to equip the people, the body, to do the work of the ministry. I love the book of Ephesians, and if I do have the privilege of serving as long-term pastor here for 10, 20, 30 years, long time, I love teaching the Word. And I've done some series that are more focused on topics, but I love doing series that are just verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Ephesians is one of my favorite books. And as we know, the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are about belief. And then the last three chapters are about behavior. The first three chapters about doctrine. The last three chapters about duty. So the Apostle Paul pours into them all the beautiful truths we have in Christ, and he fills them up with great joy. He has an, a, a trumpet prayer at the end of chapter 3 about how we're to be filled with the love of God and to, from, from every height and depth, and the love of God encompass us. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, and this trumpet prayer, and then he begins chapter 4. So turn in your Bibles with me, chapter 4, and he begins with that word, therefore. So he's trying to get us to look back to those three chapters where he's trumpeting the glory of God, the love of God, this beautiful mystery of the gospel, how we're saved by grace. We know that verse, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, how we're saved by grace. Verse 10, how we're his poema, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. We are his poema, and we are to live this life of a beautiful poem of worship. And then chapter 2, about the mystery of how all people were one in Christ. Just such a beautiful, beautiful um, whole section of Ephesians. And with all that, he says, I therefore, with all these beautiful truths in mind, a prisoner for the Lord. He, he does an about face. It's almost like he's reminding us of our royalty, that we are glorious princes and glorious princesses in the kingdom of God, by the blood of Jesus, we have this royal authority. But then he says, we're a prisoner. And this is an interesting dynamic. Paul uses the word prisoner eight times in the New Testament. He uses the word servant, or previously translated a slave or a bond slave. He uses that 23 times. So he has this dynamic of both rich, rich heritage and beautiful stature of men and women, of princes and princesses by the authority of Jesus, and yet also humbling ourselves, realizing that it's on our knees that we're to fall because he is the king of kings. So he says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. He begins with that servant posture. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So he has this beautiful, beautiful, flowing, flowing riches of doctrine. 
in chapter 1, 2, and 3, of the beautiful belief that we have, the beautiful riches we have spiritually. And then he says, walk in a manner worthy. Because we have the beautiful riches of Christ, it demands a worthy behavior. It demands attention to how we walk and how we live. And what does he say? What's the very first phrase he points to when he talks about living worthy? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. It's interesting. If I was writing that, I would imagine I would focus on something else. I would imagine I would think about live a manner worthy, many, many different adjectives. But he begins with humility. Because if we're truly prisoners, if we're truly slaves to Christ, if we truly understand his place and our place, we should maintain the posture of humility. We sang a lot about unity. Here in Ephesians, it's going to emphasize one faith, one Lord, one baptism, unity. But the way unity is achieved is by recognizing a posture of humility. Recognizing that our voice doesn't always have to be the loudest. That our opinion doesn't always need to be the one at the forefront. That other people's thoughts also have importance in the family of God. It's interesting, in Philippians, he says, let others think of yourselves, others as more highly than yourself. So this whole discussion of humility is woven all throughout the New Testament challenge to the church. Humility and gentleness and patience bearing with one another in love. I wonder how much better would our relationships go. I wonder our families, our work lives, our church life. Oh, God have mercy, our political life. If we would just follow these things, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. I love the phrase bearing with one another in love because many times we focus on offense. Were we offended? Do they need to forgive? They need to ask forgiveness. I'm not going to forgive them till they ask me for official forgiveness. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says we're required to forgive because Christ forgave us. It doesn't say we forgive when they ask for it. It says we forgive all the time because Christ forgives us. But in this phrase, it actually talks about bearing with one another. So don't even get to the point of offense because our patience level is so high, we're not even going to let ourselves be offended. Our patience level is so great that we're just going to let that go without officially calling it an offense. That's what he wants to do as we come together as the family of God. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. He goes on in verse 3, eager to maintain unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, as we dig through these verses, what's interesting is it's almost like he's standing back as a scientist, and he first has the overall landscape, and then he gets glasses, and then he gets a magnifying glass, and then he gets a microscope, and then he gets a powerful... All through this passage here in Ephesians, you're going to see him dig deeper. And then on that next point, dive deeper. And then again, dive deeper even more. And so that's what he does. He's talking about humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and love. And so now he's going to talk about that. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. He's going to elaborate on unity. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So he calls us to this humility. He calls us to this unity. And then he gives us the ultimate reason. Because we are one. Because God is one. Because everything about our faith and life is oneness. In heaven, last week we talked about heaven, but in heaven, that is going to be one of the joys. That is going to be one of the cries of, of wonder that we experience. 
our desire for peace, our desire for unity, our wrestling with unity, our wrestling with peace, we will finally achieve that fullness, oneness, that full unity that will bring such a deep, deep sense of peace and joy to our souls. One body, one spirit, one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, it's important to remember that in all these letters that Paul wrote, they experienced difficulty. It wasn't that he wrote these things as if they were in perfect unity. We know every letter he wrote was pointed at certain struggles the churches were having. And we know even through the book of Acts that the leadership themselves wrestled with different things. So on this earth, we do have feet of clay. On this earth, there is a wrestling that needs to happen in the realm of unity. One of my favorite books is by Jim Collins, and it's the book called Good to Great. It's a business book, and he talks about the principle of wrestling, and when we come together as a team, we get in the boardroom, and the most successful companies have very spirited debates. They don't just get an opinion and everybody just says yes. They don't have a bunch of yes men on their team. They have rich and spirited and emotional and passionate wrestlings with ideas. And it's out of that wrestling the best ideas come. And they did this research as they looked at all the top industries and they found what are the best companies out of all those industries? Those that are able to wrestle with things in their meetings. And so it's okay to wrestle. That's healthy. Unity doesn't mean that we can't have discussion, that we can't have wrestling. It doesn't mean that we have to have, have zero disagreement. We should come at things with different perspectives. But in the end, are we able to bow our knee in humility? Are we able to say, you know, one Lord, one faith. Overall, all these issues we're discussing, the most important thing, we're united in Christ. One Lord, one faith. Then he digs deeper, and he, he talks about this grace, and he then talks about how this unity is achieved. Verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So he's going to be talking about spiritual gifts in the coming verses here. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. We could take a whole sermon just on this verse, and there is a little bit of discussion as to what he's talking about. Some people say, is this where it's talking about Christ descending into the lower parts of hell? And I know some have asked me about the Apostles' Creed and this whole thing of Christ descending into hell. My theological interpretation here is when he's talking about descending into the lower regions, it says right there, verse 9, descended into the lower regions, comma, the earth. He's talking about coming from the glory of heaven and descending down into the earth, humbling himself as a man, it says in Philippians 2. So I do not think this is talking about Christ descending to the depths of hell. I think it's talking about Christ descending to the earth and being humble, made as a man. I also believe the reason why I don't think Christ ever descended into hell is because what did he say when he was on the cross? He said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. He didn't say, now when I get back in three days from hell, I'm, I'm going to hang out in hell for a couple days. And then when I get back, I'll rejoin you in paradise. No, he said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. And so that theologically tells me that Christ went Christ suffered on the cross when he was crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the suffering being separated from God because of our sin. And when he died, I believe he was in the presence of the Heavenly Father, and he was there. Verse 11, it says, now it's talking about the gifts. So Christ descended down to walk the earth to give us salvation and to give us gifts. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So it's talking now about different roles. 
shepherds or pastor. So he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Some translations say the pastors and the teachers. We'll get into those words in a minute. But more importantly, verse 12, what it says. Why? Why did he give those gifts? Why did he give those roles to equip the saints for the work of the ministry? But that's the purpose. He didn't give those gifts because they had to run everything. He didn't give those gifts because they had to take care of the church. He gave the gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And then he says, why? Why? Verse 13, he keeps digging deeper, deeper, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the very reason why he gives the leadership gifts is to equip the body so they can be unified, so they can be built up into a mature, stable faith in Christ. Now let's look at some of these gifts because they are important ones. And before we do that, what we need to remember is that we live on beautiful Cape Cod, and we live in Championville, New England. We are blessed to be living here in Cape Cod. We are blessed that our sport teams bring victory after victory. I mean, I don't know if you like the Patriots. I'm a bit of a Patriots fan. But the fact that they've had a run of so much success over the past couple of decades was because the coach, many people believe he's one of the best coaches of all time, he has a three-word motto. Do your job. And it's interesting, as he coaches the team, he's one of the only coaches who will pick players to be the long snapper. There's no other team that drafts a long snapper. They always pick them up after the draft on the, on the, on the heap of extra players. He will pick punters and kickers, and he always is mocked by all the pundits because he uses some of these key picks for the little guys. Belichick realizes that every single job counts, that every single role counts. What some people will discount as, as miscellaneous, minuscule, no, no, no. We need someone who's really good at this job. Do your job. And what we find here in Ephesians is he begins with this whole thing of prisoner, slave, humility. So the whole backdrop is be humble. And so when he talks about gifts, he's not trumpeting, oh, this is the, this is the special elevated ones. No, he's bringing a whole remembrance of humility. And in that, he's talking tactically, do your job. Yes, there's apostles. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word apostolus, special delegate, a messenger, an official ambassador. And so an apostle in the early days of the church, as we know, it was much like Paul, where he had uh, spiritual authority, spiritual oversight over a region. And we see that here. We, as a church, we decided to join the four C's, and we're connected to their leadership team. We have the overseed team where these folks have been pastors for, for, for decades, have really shown their leadership acumen and skill and, and, and godly life. And so we listen to them. At our next leadership meeting, we're going to have someone from the Four Seas group come in, a pastor come in, and give us wisdom on how to keep growing. Monthly, I meet with these pastors who lead our Four Seas in the region. I meet with Pastor Ben down the road. He heads up a pastoral team of all the pastors of Cape Cod, and we come together. In many ways, he's like an apostle in the sense is that he's shepherding shepherds. Uh, we have the Glory of God movement that we're part of as well, Glory of God on Cape Cod. And so we understand that these are important things to be connected to regional leaders. And for us as a church, we're not just rogue on our own. We are connected to the worldwide body of Christ and the leadership structure that God has in this region. It also talks about prophets. In Greek, prophetas. And we know in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, this is about a foreteller. This is someone who sees things in the future. Who, who has a sense that everybody might not be on the right track. And this, this person has clarity about what's coming and, and gives warning. Hey, 
hey, we got to be careful. Hey, we got to make an adjustment here. Prophets are critical for the body of Christ. We need each and every prophet. It's a role. Sometimes prophets are uncomfortable because they, they tell us and they point their finger and they say, you need to get things in line, but we need them. Unity doesn't mean that we don't listen to voices that we don't want to hear every day. Unity means that together in the symphony, we have all these different instruments playing, do your job, and a beautiful symphony is created. So we need prophets to tell us, to warn us, to help us, to take attention for things ahead. We also need evangelists. Uh, in the Greek, evangelistas, bearer of good tidings, speaker of the gospel. This is really just a gospel teller. This is someone who just, just emanates the good news. Now, in each of these roles, we all have a part to do. We all should be authoritative in Christ. We all should be warning of the future. We all should be sharing the gospel. But there's some who have a deeper calling and a deeper gifting in that. And we need evangelists in our church. That's why we started the Christianity Explored. And I remember years ago when I was in a pastoral coaching team uh, in Cincinnati, I was part of, of that whole pastor who started the Random Acts of Kindness movement, Servant Evangelism. I was able to sit under him as he began getting that going in the early 90s. And he would always say, you need to find the people who are the seekers, where they're going to lead you to the people who are seeking Christ. And those people are so special because those seekers, those bringers, are those who bring people in. We need evangelists here. We all need to be sharing the gospel, but oh God, oh God, bring those specially gifted people who just have a, a, a Holy Spirit gifting to lead others to Christ, to invite others to church, to just have that winsome personality, that loving ear, that they just develop connections and they're able to invite people in. That's what we need to help grow. the. We need all these roles to help grow the church. We need apostles. We need prophets. We need evangelists. And we need pastors. Poeminas. That means a shepherd, a feeder, a protector, a ruler of the flock it's defined as. And then the word teacher, diadaskalos. We remember the word disciple. It's almost connected to uh, being like a disciple maker, the teacher, the master, instructor. But what's interesting is many theologians believe that these two words really go together, that it's not separate pastor and teacher. It's really the pastor teacher. It's like a hyphenated word in a sense. And that really makes sense to me because if you're going to have a good teacher, he needs to care for the church. If you're going to have someone who's instructing the church, has to have a loving pastoral heart where he knows the things to address, where he knows the focal points or the hurt points or the growth points that are necessary. So pastor, teacher. If you just have a teacher that just lays down the law but doesn't do it with love, not going to get very far. I remember a missionary once said, if you really want people to hear what you say, you have to let them know that you love them. It's not so important for them to hear you, but if you love them, then they will want to hear you. And I believe that's very much why the pastor teacher is a combined office. Because if you have a loving pastor, the people open their hearts and they want to be taught. If you have a loving pastor, he's gonna be focusing on subjects that are important for the church family. But there's other gifts too. We know the, the Bible talks about other sections. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Once again, he's talking about the body. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about unity, the body. He talks about we all have different parts. Not everybody's the eye. Not everybody's the nose. We all have different members. And then in verse 27, he lists the gifts. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. So once again, you see some of these similar gifts. Then 
miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And then in verse 31, he then ends this whole chapter and he says, what's the most important gift? Love. That's right. So let's not get over, over focused on these titles. He says, hey, but earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will still show you a more excellent way. And then he gives us the love chapter, the beautiful love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Romans 12. Turn to Romans 12 if you have your, your Bible there. And we know Romans 12, uh, that very famous, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship or your spiritual worship. So he calls them to a life of sacrifice. He calls them to a life of, of giving themselves to the service of God. And then in verse 4, he lays out the gifts. For as in one body, it's interesting, and every single time he talks about the gifts, Ephesians, Corinthians, Romans, he begins with the one body. So he wants us to know the gifts are separate, but it's all about oneness. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if serving in our serving, to the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Once again, verse 9, let love be genuine. So interesting. Every time he talks about the spiritual gifts, he talks about oneness of the body, he enumerates the gifts, and then he focuses us on love. We need to remember that. That's the key. The gifts aren't about titles. The gifts aren't about position or power. The gifts are about oneness in love. And as it says back in Ephesians 4, the purpose to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. The whole purpose of the gifts is so that we can do the work together. Now, a very loving, a very dear brother challenged me in a recent leadership meeting, and he said, Pastor Greg, I think you sometimes say, I where you're committing to do too much, and you need to let others do the work as well. And I received that challenge. I received that. I thanked, I thanked that person for saying that. On the one hand, I need to clarify. When I say I, what I mean is I will take that as a responsibility. I'm not necessarily going to do it all. Last night when we had the dinner, I didn't cook it all. Paul picked up the pizzas. And Karen ran out for the salad and the drinks and the dessert and so forth. So I coordinated it. But when I said I, I meant I got it. I got it. I'm going to make sure it's done. But I do need to grow in my delegating. And I receive that as a challenge. And I say thank you. That's something I need to get better at. But we need to recognize the purpose is equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And then he says, why? Until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then why again? He delves even deeper. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children. The Apostle Paul had difficulties in his church life too. It's not just in modern times that we see troubles. You read through the New Testament, wow, they dealt with some drama. Not easy. Here he says, we shouldn't be children. We can't be playing and throwing sand at each other in the sandbox. No more of that. Come on now. Let's grow up. Don't be tossed to and fro by every wave and every doctrine. You know, back then, could you imagine what Paul had to deal with? They had all these different, completely different beliefs. They would have these teachers come in and teach heresy against Christ, he'd have to come in and clean that up. So the struggles we have in modern day churches, they're difficult, sure, but I'm thankful that we have a unity of the faith. We have small things, small struggles, but 
for the most part, Paul really dealt with some tough stuff. He says, these people would come in tossed to and fro by every doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And he ends on love again. The whole purpose of today, if even the vote, if you will, it's, it, it's not about an office. It's about just taking a step so that we can all engage deeper and using our gifts to equip the body, to strengthen the body, to serve the region, so that Christ is lifted up, so that together we can grow in love and touch this region with the love of Christ. Let's all pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, even as we think about the beauty of being one in Christ, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We thank you for our oneness. And Lord, we also thank you for gifts. I ask for Holy Spirit. I ask for an increase in the Holy Spirit, of gifting, increase of our awareness of what gifts you're stirring in us, increase of boldness, increase of faith to step into these gifts. I ask for an increase of apostles, of prophets, of evangelists, pastors, teachers, of all these gifts, Lord. Leadership, helps, generosity. Oh God, increase these gifts among us. And Lord, we lay them all at your feet. We are your church. You, Christ, are the head of the church. We worship you, Christ. Lead us. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.